The Southern Appalachian Mountains are a complex mosaic composed of belting environments, spectral slopes, and mended together by all kinds of diversity. When guided by the contours of the mountains, one will find river valleys that stretch for miles. Here, between the rolling mountains and twisting water, lays land suitable for civilization. Long ago, these plots of flat land along the river were first cultivated by Cherokee. In the river valley towns, an important resource can be found here, one that has contributed to the environment in Cherokee culture for thousands of years. Arundinaria gigandi, commonly mistaken for Asian bamboos, is a member of the grass family and one of three North American members of the subfamily Bambusi. Because it is typically found along rivers and floodplains, it is commonly referred to as river cane. The plant's tall, thin green culms contain chlorophyll. So, like the plant's leaves, the culms also absorb sunlight for photosynthesis. The joint between segments of the culm where the branches sprout are called nodes. This joint occurs regularly along the length of the culm. As new shoots emerge from the ground, a leaf from each node wraps itself around the culm, protecting its soft tissue until the plant hardens. Once mature, the foliage leaves sprout from the branches, resulting in an exceptionally bushy display. River cane grows in sandy soils along waterways in large thickets called cane breaks and once dominated the southeastern United States. Adam Griffith, working alongside river cane, provides insight on how the cane is uniquely noted in our landscapes today. We're standing uh, up Caney Fork and Caney Fork was named years and years ago for the river cane growing here. And it's just one of hundreds and hundreds of place names across the United States that have cane in them. Caney Fork, Caney Branch, Cane Patch, Cane River, uh, all over the United States, particularly in the Southeast where the cane is, is native, uh, there, there are place names with cane in it. Um, and this is no exception. So driving up and down Caney Fork Road just past campus, you probably saw dozens and dozens of patches of river cane. And once you start seeing it, you, you just, it's very hard to stop seeing it. Um, it's, it's not as tall as the non-native bamboo, um, and it uh, is evergreen, so you'll see these green patches persisting in the winter. But it's, it's a pretty uh, unmistakable plant once you get the hang of identifying it. In America, river cane grows as far north as Maryland, south to Florida, and as far west as Missouri, Ohio, and Texas. During his expedition in 1539 across what is now the southeastern United States, Hernando de Soto noted vast expanses of impenetrable cane breaks. F.A. Sondley notes in his History of Buncombe County, North Carolina, that the French Broad River in Asheville once had miles of river cane breaks. Like all bamboos, river cane is a grass. It reproduces primarily clonally underground. So this entire wall of river cane behind me could be one genetic organism. Uh, the river cane basically is two thirds biomass above ground and one third underground. So one third of the mass of the plant is below the surface of the soil and about two thirds is visible, is what we're looking at above the surface of the soil. A river cane plant has the potential to produce hundreds of columns throughout its rhizome stems. This extensive rhizome system tethers each plant to the ground using horizontal underground stems and lateral shoots. These stems weave themselves between combs, creating a network for the cane break that acts as a giant net, catching, filtering, and distributing nutrients. From an environmental perspective, river cane has many benefits, 
many of which are thanks to its density. Environmentally, some of the benefits of river cane include reducing erosion with the dense network of rhizomes that we're standing on, uh, hold the soils together during flood events. The water is significantly slowed down because of the large number of stems, uh, technically called culms, that uh, grow in a dense patch of river cane like this called a cane break. So that dense network of rhizomes hold the soils together and then slow down the waters significantly during flood events. Research has shown that water coming off of an agricultural field will percolate through the soils where river cane grows, and river cane can actually remove excess nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment at a higher rate or equal to a riparian buffer of mixed species. Uh, it outperforms all other grasses, ryegrass, switchgrass in academic literature, and it just does a great job improving the water quality and keeping excess nutrients out of the water. This is a problem because excess nutrients in the water promote algal blooms or algal growth and can decrease food availability for fish and natural uh, benthic organisms. The cane's density above and below makes it one of the best riparian buffers for catching pollutants and other organics before they reach the river. Its rhizomes firmly grasp the earth growing up to six feet down and into newly deposited soils along riverbanks. The rhizomes bind the soil between culms, like mortar and brick, effectively reducing agricultural runoff and the erosion of riverbanks. Today, riverbank erosion is a serious threat towards bank stabilization and the many roads and railways that follow the river. As parts of an effort made in the 1950s to combat this, Thousands of vehicles were stripped of their mechanical parts and placed within and along riverbanks to prevent their further erosion. The use of car bodies to stem erosion became known as the Detroit Riprap. However, these efforts resulted in a significant eyesore, posing environmental threats with their excesses of paint, grease, oil, and rust now sitting in the river. While this method proved unfruitful, other means of erosion prevention may be sought out through the use of river cane and other mixed species of plants that offer a better avenue towards the stabilization of stream banks and prevention of agricultural pollution. Additionally, when rivers overflow, the alluvial soils within and surrounding cane breaks are enriched with nutrients, enabling the land to support a diverse range of organisms. One of the amazing things about being inside a cane break you're seeing all the different habitat niches for the animals. On the floor of the cane break, you've got this thick, fluffy leaf litter layer with fluffy light soils underneath. And there's a lot of mole, vole, shrew, and mouse activity in there, small mammals, raccoons. Um, next, where the stems are, the culms. Uh, and then up towards the top, we have the canopy. And so when the river cane is fruiting and producing seed, this is a huge food source for birds and other animals as the seeds fall to the ground. The cane breaks provide valuable sustenance and dense cover for animals. This ecosystem supports various kinds of undergrowth and high populations of wildlife. The Cherokee once scoured the cane breaks during the lean months of winter because of the reliable hunting grounds they provided. River cane habitats were integral for Cherokee not only for its fertile soils, game density, and retention of river overflow, but also as a resource. Culturally, river cane was an essential part of life in Cherokee river towns. As a resource, it is extraordinarily pliable and was adopted for a multitude of uses. River cane is actually an amazing plant. Uh, we can divide up the benefits into a couple of categories. The cultural benefits are significant for the Native Americans that have used it. Uh, the cultural benefits extend not only beyond the Cherokee historical territories, but to other tribes as well. Uh, one historian called it the plastic of Southeastern Native Americans, and it was used for a wide variety of things in everyday household items like sleeping mats, mats for preparing food, used in the houses themselves, in the walls, in the roofs, uh, used to catch fish in the rivers, make fishing creels out of them, and just on and on and on, a wide variety of uses. It, it really is a, a, a 
amazing plan uh, culturally. The Cherokee, Choctaw, and Chittimacha use this resource for its wide range of applications in crafting and building. It was used according to size and age among native communities. Larger river cane was used to create the walls of homes. First split and aligned parallel to each other, and then tied and dried. A net of river cane wattle was applied to the wall, as well as layers of thick mud called dwab, making the walls resistant to the cold winter climate. Younger river cane was used to create a number of things like traps, flutes, weaponry, and decor. Although when further split, the river cane may be used as a weaving material to create intricate mats and baskets. Rivercane basketry is arguably one of the most important and influential domestic crafts used among southeastern Native Americans. The, the history of rivercane basketry is probably the oldest tradition, not just of the Cherokee, but a lot of the southeastern tribes that are indigenous to this area. Rivercane was bountiful, and, and so it was used for a lot of different things. The, the cane was used for wall mats and for sleeping pads and for room dividers. And they used the cane for thatching on the roofs and they used, they used the cane for a lot of different things. The basketry was storage, was harvesting, was gathering, was it, it, everything had a use and a purpose. And so many of the tribes of the Southeast wove and continue to weave. The Cherokee, Choctaw, and Chittimacha used river cane as a weaving material. Today, Cherokee basket making is perhaps the most well-known use for this versatile material. The basket's iconic patterns and artisanship are sources of its popularity today, but were once a crucial part of everyday life. According to Sarah H. Hill in her journal outlining Cherokee baskets from the Spring Place Mission, she says, basket making belongs to the world of Cherokee women who were the chief, if not the only manufacturers among the Cherokee. Females shared numerous roles in ceremonial and subsistence activities, representing an essential part of the community's identity. According to the Museum of the Cherokee Indian, the Cherokee were made up of an estimated 14 clans, although through the years this number has been reduced to seven. These clans each provided for and protected the community by upholding their predisposed responsibility. This was the most important affiliation a person had within the kinship system, and it was passed through the mother. This matrilineal role in Cherokee society surprised Europeans when honored or elder women would represent their community in council meetings. Which was funny. Um, they would accuse the Cherokee men of having a petticoat government. And the more that they learned about the Europeans, they then would respond and say, well, don't you serve the queen? Is she not the head of your government? in England, um, so they didn't think of it that way. It was perfectly fine to have their queen being the head of the government, but it was not okay for the Cherokees to have that. Women in artisanship share a deep relationship that extends beyond common practice and is outlined within sacred Cherokee stories. This is evident in the Cherokee story of the first fire the world is split by light and darkness. In the night, the animals of the world were cold and couldn't see. So they prayed to the Creator for something to eliminate the cold darkness. Lightning explodes from the sky in a thunderous crack. Its light stretches far beyond the water, striking a sycamore tree on an island. The animals see a faint glow growing from the distant smoke. The first fire. Every animal that could fly or swim was anxious to try for the fire. Raven flew to the fire only for it to singe its feathers black. The owl then approached from high above only for the hot smoke to burn circles around his eyes. 
The racer snake, having swam to the island, climbs up the tree, getting burned and scarred with a black coat. After many trials, the animals held a meeting to determine who could obtain the fire. Eventually, a small voice cried out, claiming to have a plan. The council looked down to the ground, wondering who was strong enough to bring the fire back. Spotting the speck on the ground, Kananeski, a little water spider, asserted that she could do it. The council, having no objection, sent her to try for the fire. Swimming across the water and reaching the now simmering embers, Kananeski would make a container to hold and transport an ember of fire and light to the Cherokee world. These beliefs associate women with containers that are essential to life. The story of the first fire features alternate versions where Kananeski would either weave a container or use clay to create a bowl. When you think of family groups being the potters, family groups being the basket makers, it's very possible that they took the story and adapted it to what they were the best at. Now some tribes, they will only tell stories in the winter time when the animals are asleep and can't hear them or else the animals might think that they're being made fun of. Cherokee's not like that. We tell stories all the time. Uh, but the storytellers were well known for being able to tell the stories. They even say some of them have to be able to remember the story exactly. I mean exactly like, like it was 15,000 years ago that it did not change. Not Cherokee. We change it all the time. <laughs> Although the method Kananeski used to transport the ember may have been adopted over time, the story still symbolizes Kananeski as a female who enabled and sustains life as both a weaver and a potter. In August, during what is the New Year for the Cherokee, a ceremony would take place to reenact the capture of fire. So what they do is everybody puts up their fire and they would travel to that council house and get a new fire to take back home. And they would put it like in, in the pottery or they would do a, like a, a shell, a turtle shell, and take the embers back, back home. Women would carry burning coals from the townhouse to rekindle the hearths and homes. These beliefs and ceremonial practices carried out by the communities display a profound association between women and artisanship. Cherokee women would not only harvest the cane for use, but would also tend to it. Over time, river cane may begin to lose its dominance to other plant species in the community. To maintain the river cane, Cherokee would burn the foliage within the cane breaks. This method would reduce the vegetation and enrich the soils without disturbing the river cane's rhizome system. This was typically done in the winter, and after so, in late spring, new shoots would arise from the rhizomes, growing at the same rate of the native elk's antlers, an easy one inch a day. The maintenance of river cane through controlled burns is one of the many ways Cherokee and their ancestors shaped the landscape of the southern Appalachian Mountains. After river cane reaches maturity and a desired length and width, Cherokee would cut the cane from the earth for use. Cane harvesting is typically carried out during the cooler months of the year and is today extremely technical because of the resources scattered location. Unfortunately, some people go into cane breaks to harvest and sell the cane for use, although this form of use for the resource as a means of revenue has been damaging to the ecosystems because of the large amounts taken and low amounts actually used in basketry. The use of this resource among Cherokee is very selective. Only what is needed for a project is taken. Once removed for basket making, the cane stems are split and the outer layer is peeled away. The splints are then trimmed into long and even strips with sharp edges that are later trimmed individually on both sides. Thickness that you wanted. 
And then you would have to scrape it and you would trim it and then you can, uh, it would be ready to dye. And this is some finished splints that are dyed and this is the blood root. And then we put it in pots and boil it. So, I mean, that's a simple little process, but go up the mountain and go dig some blood root. The processing of the river cane into the weaving material is what makes up the majority of time spent during the basket making process. After the weaving material is prepared, the strips may be boiled in dyes to highlight the complex patterns made during the weaving process. Native plants like black walnut, bloodroot, yellowroot, and butternut are used for their earthly rich colors. And my best time, I thought, was when we'd go cane hunting and we'd go into the woods to get the materials and the dyes. I thought that was the best time because I got to run around. I got to run around and the little flowers, you know, with the blood root, you got a little flower that says, you know, this, I'm blood root, you know, so you're like, oh, you know, but we were always taught half. You only get half because that is what is giving you the colors of your basket, your designs. So when we've done the roots, we or harvest anything, we only took half. After particular strips are dyed, river cane baskets are then woven one of two ways, single weave or double weave. Single weave baskets were the most common in Cherokee households and are composed of a single layer of interlaced cane starting at the bottom and mended at the top using a rim of oak or hickory. Double weave baskets are essentially two baskets, one woven within the other, conjoined by a common rim and mended at the base. The artisanship shown in each layer of interweaved cane is easily a testament to the many years of mastery required to produce these intricately laced baskets. My way of thinking is while I'm making a basket, I want to see how much better I can make the next one than the last one was. So we, we like to do different shapes and see, just to see what we can turn out. The first basket I made, I was ashamed of it. <laughs> I was ashamed of it because it was all lopsided and one-sided and wouldn't sit straight. <laughs> But over the years, I learned how to work with them to where they're likely set up by themselves without me having to hold them up. <laughs> when I started this basket, I wanted to work my material down about as narrow as I could get them. And I wanted them all to be about the same size. And I wanted this to be the finest ba double weave basket I'd made. And it took me a long time to get it built up to where it to turned it down and I even took it to a couple of shows while I was working on it. And uh, when I finally did get it finished, I was, I was pretty proud of it. Because I thought to myself, this is what I'd strive for to see what I could do with this basket. I knew I, in my mind what I wanted to do when I first thought about it, but it took me a while to get started because it took me a while to, to get the material ready for it. Double and single weave baskets were notably made to fulfill many domestic purposes, speaking volumes about Cherokee life. It tells people who we are and what we're about, what our lifestyle was like a long time ago before the European influence, you know, and how we lived and how we lived off the land. Basketry was used every day, serving purposes in ceremonial practices, sorting, storage, cooking, and trade. The baskets also shared a small role in a game played leisurely among Cherokee. Although many Cherokee games are competitive, the Butterbean game was a social pastime for all tribal members, played by teams or one-on-one. -on -one. The game involved six split butter beans that were placed in a flat basket and then tossed into the air. Each of the beans shared two colors, and how they landed would determine the score. The light side of the bean was six points, and the dark side was four points. The first to 24 would win. Today, this game continues among community members and is commonly adopted to fit other rules, such as going over 24 resulting in a bust, resetting the player back a number of points. Basketry today is a culturally meaningful practice that once encompassed several aspects 
of everyday life. Upon European contact and the tribulations that followed, Cherokee basket making continued, but its economic use would begin to change. Over time, basketry would become a source of cash value in the changing market economy. For many generations, the practice continued as a means of revenue. I raised my family making baskets, and back then I had to do it to take care of my family. I was the sole supporter of eight kids. I had help from my mother-in-law back then. I, cut, I hated making baskets because I knew I was having to do it because I had to. But after I got my family raised and uh, decided I wanted to make baskets, I really got into it and I really enjoyed making baskets. And I've, you know, really been, that's my hobby. That's what I do. You have to like your work in order for somebody else to enjoy your work. The baskets were sought after by Europeans who would often trade goods and occasionally gold pieces to have their own. Sir Francis Nicholson, the first royal governor of South Carolina, brought two double weave baskets along with him during his final voyage home to London. One of these baskets survives today in the British Museum. This basket and archeological evidence having survived antiquity and predating European contact displays how Cherokee basketry today has maintained its form and function over time. Although Cherokee basketry predates written records, excavations at various Cherokee settlements suggest the practice was fully developed by the late woodland period, between 600 and 900 AD. Remarkably, many of the same methods and techniques used in basketry are evident as early as 7500 BC, Evidence of basketry is found among community dwellings, burials, and alongside ceremonial artifacts, reinforcing basketry's known domestic uses. Archaeological evidence displays continuity over time regarding the basket's composition, having been made from the same materials and means of processing, including the colored dyes that are still used today. After European contact, when the, when the indigenous tribes started getting pushed back and, and then the removal and everything. As they advanced back into the mountains, then they started using other resources available, whether it was white oak or honeysuckle or some of the things that we are using now. White oak, white oak is just as much work. You gotta go to the woods, you gotta find your tree, you gotta cut it down, drag it home, and then you pretty much process it the same way as the cane. You cut it kind of like a pizza. Then you get those and then you peel it apart with the, uh, with the growth rings. And then you scrape it until you get it as thin, thick as you want it. And then you dye it, same dyes. Honeysuckle, go to the woods, get your honeysuckle. It's, it's, that, it's a material that was available to us and that's what we used. In, in South Carolina, they use long needle pines. In Hawaii, they use banana leaves. Whatever's available to you is, is what you use. And that's what we use. And many of the tribes of the Southeast use river cane. The loss of territory conversely introduced new weaving materials. White oak and honeysuckle basketry introduced many new beautiful baskets. These new baskets were a light in the dark, but the darkness would continue to grow following European contact. During what can only be described as a period of cultural genocide, the double weave technique was nearly lost. A Cherokee elder by the name of Rebecca Tonita was the last basket maker that could perform the double weave technique. She was initially reluctant to teach the technique, but after some convincing from Lottie Stamper, she learned, mastered, and taught the technique for nearly 30 years, preserving the knowledge. Although this technique was not the only thing under threat of loss, many other cultural practices were in peril because of the brutalization and assimilation of Cherokee culture into mainstream American ideals. After the military campaign of Colonel James Grant in 1761 and General Griffith Rutherford in 1776, which looted and burned many Cherokee towns in western North Carolina, Cherokee towns were not the lively hubs of prosperity they had been before. They were now communities under duress. 
Quakers out of Maryville, Tennessee, to come in and construct dormitories and classrooms and provide teachers. And they did so for 10 years. And people were glad to send their children, not knowing the far-reaching effects. They just knew that their children would fail. And I asked people, what would you do if your child was starving, starving, and you couldn't feed them? You'd do anything. You would do anything. And if someone offered a place for them to go where they would eat three times a day, they opened the door for the boarding school. It was at this time when Native American children were forced into boarding schools. According to Smithers, Within the early boarding schools, Quaker education insisted the students must be instructed to clearly show sound Christian morality. The boys in the school were taught agricultural trades, while the girls were educated in domestic arts, like housekeeping and motherhood. These teachings were foreign and restricting compared to their traditional practices. There was no doubt that these children were placed in what felt like a backwards world. Their placement in these schools was not directly affiliated with education, but rather an ulterior motive, the intent to assimilate them into Western culture. They never had the opportunity to be in two different worlds at the same time. Right. It was either or. You're, you're either there and we frown on that and we punish you and we withhold the resources that you need to be successful in whatever, or you totally assimilate and you get your hair cut and are punished for speaking. And that practice continued even when the boarding school closed and they off and they opened up the day schools. They had one in Soho, Birdtown, and Big Hope. And my husband was six and spoke no English, not even hello. And he went to the day school and didn't have a clue as to what they were saying. He said, and I asked him if he was ever punished for speaking in charity. He said, no, I was too little. He said, but the older boys, they really punish. The boarding schools were recognized as re-education camps designed to restrain the use of common practices and Cherokee language. Speaking essentially is how you think. Uh, I was fortunate in being able to communicate and to understand the world through the use of that language. We were told that the old people said that the language was given to us by the Creator. It is a gift. If it has been given in such a manner, then it becomes a sacred thing. It is a way in which we reach into each other's hearts. To lose that, they said, to stop speaking that language, is to stop that kind of understanding of the world and also the robbing of the coming generations of a gift that was intended for them. And we are told that that is theft, and that is not the way human beings are supposed to do, and that is not how you treat gifts. It was during this period when cultural traditions and language gradually faded by generation. The loss of cultural knowledge and traditions among children caused much damage. However, this cultural purge they faced together would foster a powerful sense of cultural identity. The knowledge maintained by community elders was passed along through the teachings of customs and use of language. It was around this time in 1821 when Sequoia created the Cherokee syllabary, enabling literacy among Cherokee and paving the foundation for cultural preservation. And without asking anyone's permission, without asking, without talking to anyone about it, he set out on a course to write our language. It said that he thought that maybe you could create a symbol for every word that we had, which would run into the millions. So at some point or another, he quickly ascertained that you couldn't do it that way. So he was beginning to learn the fundamental concepts of uh, literacy. It took him 13 years to finally get to that point to where he had perfected it. And what he did was to understand that we have a certain number of sounds in our language. And so he gave a symbol to each of the sounds, which totals 85. We have 85 distinct sounds in our language, and he gave a symbol to each one of those. And so it's not an alphabet, 
but in fact, it's a syllabary. If you are a fluent speaker, you can actually learn the writing system within just a matter of a couple of days. We did not acquire a written form of the language until 1820. In those days, it said that they went from being an illiterate society to being 80% literate within a year. It was incredible. Someone traveling through the Cherokee Nation in the late 1820s noted that in traveling through one of the mountain towns was documenting what he was seeing and he saw a palisaded village of what could be construed as being Stone Age people. And inside the town, he noted several men sitting around reading a newspaper and discussing the excavations that had just begun at Pompeii. But knowledge remained persisted through language and Eastern Band elders preserving and unifying a rapidly disbanding culture. The reasons for language revitalization are many. The reason why all of that effort is important is essentially so that we can continue to be who we are. And it means that in the next generations and the generations to come, we will always be Cherokee. It's the being that is most important. Cherokee is a polysyllabic language, which means that it's verb-based. And with Western languages, nouns are the most important things. The very structure in which we view the world is incorporated into how we speak. For example, we do not begin by speaking about ourselves first. In other words, the concept of saying, I am hungry, or you know, all of those kinds of phrases that we know in English all begin with I. It sort of contends that, that we are the center of the universe. In Cherokee, it's just the opposite. Things out there are noted first, and then we bring it back to where we're at. In other words, we do not say, I see a bear. We say, bear, I see. It indicates a worldview that is different from Western European, and it's very complex. The teaching and practice of the Cherokee language had preserved their worldviews. Much like the preservation of the Cherokee language, Rebecca Tonita and Lottie Stampler would share the knowledge and methods used for making baskets, passing along this inherited knowledge from their generation to the next. Cherokee basket making has survived thanks to elder knowledge and resilience in the face of adversity. The passage of Cherokee knowledge through the context of daily life would give rise to new generations of Cherokee basket weavers. I got started by my mom, just watching my mom, my grandma, and my uh, elder, other, other elders uh, throughout my life. Uh, my grandma, Betty, Betty Lossie, worked up at the village. And I went to elementary school and just run off from school just to go up. Then my mom, my sister, my, both my uncles worked up there, pretty much the whole family. And that's where I learned the processing. As I got older, I realized it's hard work. And when you're a teenager, you're like, mm, you know? And my mom's like, she never pushed it. My mom and grandma, they never pushed it. They never told us we had to do this. But that was pretty much, I said, my babysitter was my mom didn't believe in babysitters. So when something had to be done and I had to be, Somewhere and she's working. I was always sitting next to her, picking up the scraps, you know, and she's working her material up. That was my babysitter, was just watching her and learning, you know, from the ground up. And when it's family working together, the children are around, and what they're not realizing is that they're absorbing what they're living. That's how I learned how to make uh, white oak baskets or weave white oak baskets learning the whole process, just being with mom when she took us out on the hillside to chop the tree down. And we were always with her, but we knew not to bother her because she was busy and we just played around. And um, so I absorbed all of that. So when it come time for me to uh, want to weave a basket, I already knew how because I lived it. And that's why it's important. So if we can do the same thing with other people regardless of their family or just other people in the community or someone who wants to come and take a class from us, you know, then just hang out with me. They don't necessarily have to weave. That's how we keep it alive because in, in turn that person is going to pass it on to somebody else. I guess basket making at this point is uh, more of a art form 
for me. And with any art, when you're doing that, it takes your mind away from anything else. And so it's therapy, it's, um, it's being creative. And now we can afford to do basketry as the art form and not the livelihood that our parents and grandparents before us had to, had to do to survive. The practice of basketry was once an everyday part of life and is now reserved as a culturally meaningful practice that symbolizes Cherokee heritage. The survival of basketry through hundreds of years of adversity is displayed within each layer of laced cane, that strength being preserved in each elder's craft. These are all our elders and they speak to us. They speak to us. If you just listen, they talk. They talk every single time you see their work. If you just look at the work long enough and just, just listen, they're gone. We don't live forever, but our artwork does. It is important that this art form continues for generations because it has been handed down to us for generations. It's a traditional, it's a cultural, it's a, it's a Cherokee thing. This is something that we don't read in our history books. And so for it to survive today and be here today, it needs to survive tomorrow and, and our kids need to know about it. Basketry is currently taught through a lens of context that illustrates the practice's cultural value. The teaching of this practice is being carried out by a number of basket weavers. However, despite basketry's preservation through teachings, the practice is now threatened by a very different adversity located at the source of the material. Basketry has survived antiquity, but can river cane survive environmental loss? Ninety-eight percent of the once widespread river cane habitat has now faded. A number of factors since European contact has led to river cane's decline. The author, Donald Edward Davis, describes the effect of Europeans on river cane as the most conspicuous change to come about as a result of frontier settlement and trade on the native mountain landscape. European settlements were scattered along river valleys where the cane breaks provided sustenance for their livestock and rich soils for agriculture. When agriculture took over in the southeast, a variety of factors pushed river cane to the extent that we're seeing it today. Now it tends to persist just on a narrow fringe next to a body of water. Most of the cane breaks in Western North Carolina are confined on one side by a body of water and on the other side by a road or railroad or a mowed field. So very seldom do we see river cane extending to another ecotone, such as an upland forest or a slightly different ecosystem. River cane could survive short-term disturbances and even benefit from burning, cutting, and grazing. However, when this damage was concentrated in a particular area for an extended duration of time, the cane's resilience would begin to break as settlers pushed further in with their livestock. Cattle would eat the calms and foliage as the hogs would root up and eat the nutrient-rich rhizomes. After cattle raising became commonplace in the region, cane breaks rapidly disappeared. In the mid-1750s, James Adair noted that river cane was no longer widespread in the southern Appalachians. A century later, river cane was largely reduced to its present amounts. Another factor is the sale of land in the mountains. A lot of people moved to western North Carolina and the southeast in general for an escape from the city. They come, they buy their piece of paradise on a body of water, and they mow down the native plants and the non-native plants that they see for a view of the, of the river. And we're seeing that in a lot of different places. Unfortunately, with the loss of cane breaks comes the loss of habitat. The cane break ecosystems provided a valuable habitat for a wide range of wildlife. But with its loss, animals depending on the shelter and food that the cane provided would be scattered throughout the valleys decrease in population and some would go extinct. Following reduction of cane and hunting for sport, 
the Carolina parakeet, passenger pigeon, Bachman's warbler, and eastern bison are now all extinct. The, the amount and, and the area of river cane now is, is being so depleted that it's down to like one or two percent of what it used to be uh, prior to European contact. And that's what is one of the things that makes it so difficult for us as basket weavers is to have that resource. We have to go and travel for a lot of distance to get and harvest cane anymore. You know, there, there are some patches on, on private property, but um, usually we're working with Forestry Service or someone, some organization that we can get authorization to go in and, and harvest. But, you know, as landowners are starting to realize that, that uh, we're looking for this resource, they are, there are a lot of them that are willing to cooperate and willing to uh, let us harvest there. Cherokee artisan resources have become more scarce in the Western Carolina mountains. Unfortunately, most Cherokee basket makers have to travel long distances to harvest river cane. However, this extensive loss has not gone unnoticed. There are groups that are working toward reestablishing native resources like river cane. One such organization is the revitalization of traditional Cherokee artisan resources, otherwise known as RT Carr. Uh, RT Carr came into being about 15 years ago and focuses on environmental preservation with the specific purpose of increasing the availability of resources for tribal artisans. The primary resources that we're talking about are basketry material, material for their traditional arts and crafts like blowguns, uh, carving, masks, and so woods uh, come to mind as well as river cane, which is where we're standing today. RT Carr assists the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians and has helped to fund the transplanting of river cane and prompted research at Western Carolina University. RT Carr's mission is to preserve, protect, and teach the heritage behind traditional resources, land, and culture. Traditional resources are currently undergoing revitalization at the Jesse Owl Dugan Native Plant and Greenhouse Facility. My name is David Anderson. I'm the Horticulture Operations Supervisor for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. Well, I oversee the facility, and so I come up with the production plans. We do a multitude of projects, including working with pollinators, native plants, seed banking, um, restorations, forestry. And so our job is to make sure we're producing the plant material that are needed for tribal projects. The plants in this glass propagation house are grown year-round by the request of community members and artisans that report a lack of native plant populations. Plants are also grown for forestry services regarding tribal projects. All of these plants are closely monitored and raised under controlled conditions. Once matured, everything started in here will eventually be moved to a nursery or used for a tribal project. We're mainly working on doing installations on areas that may have been in river cane production in the past. A um, lot of stream bank work as far as stabilization on our watershed projects, but we're also going in and doing invasive species removal on some areas and repop repopulating with river cane as the species of choice. Although the repopulation of river cane is underway, this task instantly becomes more tedious thanks to the mysterious fruiting and flowering of river cane. In terms of restoration, the easiest way to restore a plant is to plant the seeds. But in this case, the seeds are very hard to come by. The flowering and fruiting of river cane is poorly understood. Some bamboos operate on a genetic clock and flower and produce seed after a certain number of years. There are species in Japan, for example, that produce seed only every 76 years. And nobody actually knows the fruiting and flowering regime of river cane. Because of the complex flowering and fruiting of river cane, relying on seeds as a source of plant material for restoration is unreliable. What we're doing a lot of now, however, is transplanting river cane, where there is a patch that is large enough, we're using machinery or hand tools to dig up river cane and move it to a new location where it has more room to expand. This isn't exactly a sustainable method. 
uh, as far as repopulating river cane by taking it out of its native habitat and moving it somewhere else. But when this material is, a, is available, we're happy to do that. But we want to keep that plant in its natural habitat. But we don't, now we don't know what makes that plant go to bloom and seed. We don't know what factors causes that. So if you see a large patch of river cane out anywhere and you see it's brown and died back, that's one plant. That's a, that's a rhizome that stretched a hundred yards and all of it's gone to seed and died. We don't know what triggers that, but I would like to know why that goes to seed, when it's gonna go to seed and how I can collect that seed and use that as my propagation material rather than having to rely on using rhizomes from an existing patch to do any kind of propagation. The reestablishment of cane has been challenging and may remain so until the resource is better understood. For now, the relocation and diversification of river cane through the means of rhizome transplantation is the best way to reestablish river cane populations. Hey, my name is uh, Will Tushka. I'm the uh, horticultural technician for EBCI and I work with Natural Resources Department. It's native to our people, Cherokee people. It's used by craft people, you know, making, whether it be blow guns or um, baskets, mats, you know, stuff like that. So it's a pretty vital part of our culture. So that excites me because when you look at a basket, you see how beautiful it is. But then, and then you see the work that the workers put into it, the, the making the splints, uh, the cuts on their hands, you know, and all that put time put into it. And then you're able to go and look at, look at it in the wild or in our setting here and be able to look through the ground and see what, where it's coming from. So that, that was really a big, it was a good learning lesson for me, made me appreciate it more and appreciate those artists more. To me, it's, uh, I know there's probably a time where they could go anywhere around here and get it, what they need at their supply, but it seems like over the years, they have to go off reservation or even out of state to get a quality product. And hopefully we can bring it back where they won't have to drive as far, you know, or trek through the woods in Georgia or wherever, you know, someone go to Tennessee and Virginia, so. So hopefully we can uh, grasp it and get it going and be able to have spots around the reservation or, you know, tribal lands where we can produce it, grow it, take care of it for future generations. River cane is recognized as ecologically beneficial to the environment, supporting Southern Appalachian diversity while maintaining the rivers within. And when viewed through a lens of cultural context, the domestication of this resource forever changed life among native communities. Its significance culturally and environmentally expresses the cane's importance toward fighting riverbank erosion and maintaining Cherokee cultural practices. This single resource and the connection it had with indigenous peoples influenced culture and the relationship between people and landscapes forever. This resource today serves to benefit many people and wildlife with its application as a riparian buffer and artisan material. For thousands of years, this plant has served to benefit the environment and the people within it, weaving a relationship that still lasts today. These are my people. This is who I am. This is what I am. This is the way to present my artwork. Harvesting, teaching is great. Yeah, I love it, you know. And carrying on the, the tradition, showing them from the ground up, you know, harvesting it, to tying it, to working up, to actually making a uh, form, a basket, even if it's just a mat, you know. This is, this is who I am. This is who my family is. This is who we always will be. I'm Cherokee, you know. I'm not tied to it. I am Cherokee. And I'm proud to be one. I really am. <laughs>